All right, you're welcome to Amazing Minds, Zambia's first late night show. Today's Friday, Bible Talks. I hope you guys have your shouting clothes tonight. I won't take too much of your time doing the intros and telling you about the show. I'd like to believe that if you're here today, you may have uh, an idea of what the show is all about. If not, and you're new here, then you're welcome. Uh, we are grateful for everyone that has been tuning into this show, watching every new subscriber. We are so grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, please do subscribe. I don't know if I mentioned that already. Uh, hit that notification bell and share. We would like to see this channel grow and uh, more people hear what we have to say here. So Fridays for Bible Talks and today we're continuing uh, on a subject, a series that we've been doing so far which is the gifts of the spirit series and uh, under this series we've done a number of gifts already we did the gift of faith the gifts of healings we did the uh, word of wisdom word of knowledge and today we're doing the gift of prophecy so prophecy is the gift we are tackling today very interesting gift the bible says if you must desire spiritual gifts. As a matter of fact, the Bible encourages us to desire spiritual gifts, but it further encourages that especially that you may prophesy. So we're told to desire spiritual gifts, but especially that we should prophesy. And therefore today we are getting into the specific gift of prophecy. Uh, I do appreciate that the gift of prophecy is heavily misunderstood. I also do appreciate that many people who have an understanding of the gift of prophecy have a limited understanding of the gift of prophecy. You know, one of the things that's important for you to understand about the spirit life and the spirit realm and how spiritual things work is that the more insight, the more light you have on a particular matter, the more advantage you have and the easier it would be for you to actually practice that particular um, uh, subject or that particular thing that you have knowledge on. The Bible says the entrance of thy words giveth light and understanding to the simple. So light comes from the word of God. The more light you have in the word of God, the easier it becomes for you to navigate a path because the word of God is a lamp unto our feet. So it guides us in our path in the spirit realm, be it to prophesy, to heal the sick, to work out miracles. You need to have light that is able to guide your path in that particular assignment, that particular gift, that particular manifestation. The realm of the spirit is heavily governed by light. And the Bible goes on to further describe Jesus Christ, who is the word of God as light. It says there was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came to bear witness to that light. He was not the light, but he came to testify of that one true light. So Jesus himself being the embodiment of the word of God, we know is light. And the Bible in the book of first John further tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we are walking in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another. The Bible further tells us, I believe in the book of Timothy, God, the only wise king, dwells in the great and approachable light, which no man can see or has seen. So we know that God is described as light. He's described as being in light. His word is described as light. His word is also described as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So the, the amount of light you have on a particular subject within the word of God can determine how effective you become in that particular subject. And so today we are trying to break down the gift of prophecy to give a better understanding and insight into what prophecy really is, what it involves, the purpose of prophecy, why we must prophesy and what it really means for us to 
to prophesy. Why is it that of all gifts, the gift of prophecy is prioritized in the scriptures? We're told that I desire that you may operate in spiritual gifts, I'm paraphrasing, but especially that you may prophesy. So prophecy is a very interesting thing. The Bible in the book of Joel and Acts also talk about how that God promises that in the last days he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and our sons and daughters will prophesy that our old men shall dream dreams and our young men shall see visions. So we are also given a breakdown of how this prophecy occurs that in the idea of of prophesying, uh, in the act of prophesying, there is a place for visions and there's a place for dreams and there's a place for the spirit of God. Yes, so Amazing Minds, Zambia's first late night show, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Mondays for political discussions, Wednesdays are for the educative segment and Fridays are Bible talks like today so we've been doing this series the gifts of the spirit series uh, if you'd like to catch up you can start from the first one and today we're discussing the spirit of the gift of prophecy rather i won't read you too many scriptures but i'll try to run through uh, a couple of scriptures just to give you insight into what the gift of prophecy is i'll start by reading you three scriptures and i'll go on further to explain uh, from these scriptures, what we can learn about the gift of prophecy. So we know that the base scripture that we've been reading is, comes from uh, Corinthians, first book of Corinthians, chapter 12. And uh, this is where it's described to us just how that the Holy Spirit distributes to each and everyone differently gifts for the profit of all. So every man within the body of Christ receives a gift for the profit of everyone. And these gifts are given to the Holy Spirit as he deems, are given by the Holy Spirit as he deems fit to each individual. So we know that the Holy Spirit can give the gift of word of wisdom. He can give the word, the, the word of knowledge. He can give faith. He can give the gifts of healings. He can give the working of miracles. He can give prophecy, the discernings of spirits or discerning of spirits. He can give um, the diverse kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. So today we're focusing on the gift of prophecy and how the gift of prophecy operates, the purpose for the gift of prophecy why the gift of prof prophecy is important and prioritized over other gifts. And we're going to look at the history of this gift of, uh, of prophecy. All right, let's get into it. Revelation chapter 19, verse nine to 10. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I know I said I'll read you three scriptures and then go further, but I, I feel I must really narrow in into this scripture before we go further. Notice how that an angel appears to John or at least uh, one that he believes to be an angel and begins to give him a revelation from God to Jesus Christ that is passed on to John through the mouth of an angel, right? And John decides, eh, 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 the words that this angel is telling me are too deep. I need to bow down and worship. And just as John begins to do that, the angel explains to him saying, see that you do not do that because I'm a servant like you. Of your brethren that carry the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we read in the book of uh, Peter, I believe a, a few Bible talks ago, how that angels long to look into these things because the gospel of Jesus Christ is for the benefit of we 
human beings. We know this to the extent that when a godly man in the book of Acts was giving alms and praying to God, an angel appeared to him and said, go to Peter and he is going to tell you words by which you can be saved. Go to Peter and he is going to tell you words by which you will be saved. So the angel appears to a man and tells him, God has recognized your giving and God has recognized your prayer, but you're not yet saved. Go to Peter. Peter is going to give you words by which you and your family will be saved. Now, question is, why couldn't angels, why couldn't this particular angel give words to Peter on, uh, or rather to this man, that, that, that instead he referred him to Peter? Why couldn't the angel himself give him the words by which he should be saved? It's because this assignment to give the words of the gospel, to bring people into salvation, to cause people to become born again, this assignment has been given to human beings. Human beings carry the testimony of Jesus Christ. They are the ones that are able to give to their fellow human beings the message by which they should be saved. Angels can do it. The Bible says angels long to look into these things. They do not understand the concept of the gospel. Angels are still living in the Old Testament. They do not understand Jesus Christ. The Bible goes as far as saying, great is the, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, seen of angels, justified in the spirit, preached on unto the Gentiles and believed on in the world, taken up into glory. So the angels saw God for the first time when they saw Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says God was manifested in the flesh, seen by angels. Now, if you've been following Bible talks, you know that I've explained to you guys how that we have different worlds apart from the world we live in. And the Bible in the book of Genesis tells us after God created the heavens and the earth, that these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. So we know that the concept of generations does not begin on earth. The concept of generations begins in the heavens. So the concept of generations begins in the heavens. We are also told in the book of Hebrews that by faith, we know that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Now, in understanding this, we also need to understand what Paul says when he says, I know of a man who was taken up into the third heaven and he heard words that are not lawful to be uttered here. Those words are lawful to be uttered in the third heaven, but they are not lawful to be uttered here. In the same way, you could say that the words by which men should be saved may not be lawful to be uttered there, but they are lawful to be uttered here. I hope I'm giving you a clear picture that God has separated the worlds. We have angelic races and angelic beings who cannot bring to us a message of salvation. That the words uttered in their world may not be uttered here. And that the words meant for our world may not be uttered there. So we know that this angel is not worthy to carry the message of Jesus to give to human beings. Okay, I'm trying to stress a point here. Now, this scripture tells us that an angel appears to John and declares that he has the testimony of Jesus. What exactly does this mean? If an angel can bring a message to John and tell him, don't bow before me. See that you do not do that. Don't worship me. I'm a servant like you who carries the testimony who has the testimony of Jesus? Now, many of you may be wondering why 
But the angel himself answered. He further goes on to say, worship God for the testimony. He describes this testimony. The testimony that this angel says he has of Jesus. He describes it. He says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this angel describes what exactly this testimony of Jesus that he has is. And I bring this to your attention in order for you to understand the importance and purpose for prophecy. And I would like to take you back to when we first see this manifestation in the Bible and how it happened and what the purpose was for. And yeah, let's, let's, let's get further into the scriptures just so we can see exactly uh, what prophecy is all about. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 to 25. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up his flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now born of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I want you to notice something. Some people may think it was God that named Eve woman or even named her Eve. No, it was, it was Adam. But before we get into that, let me read you the second scripture. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 to 16. Now, when the sun was gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your father's place in peace, to your father's in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. All right. So Adam is made by God. God places Adam in a garden that he planted eastward in Eden. Okay. So the garden itself is not called Eden, but the garden was planted eastward in Eden. So we have earth that God has made and God then creates a place called Eden within earth. And within Eden, God plants a garden. Now take note, God did not plant trees. God did not plant fruits. He planted a garden. So God took of a heavenly environment and planted an entire garden on earth, eastward in Eden. And God took Adam from where he was. So Adam wasn't initially in Eden or in, or in the garden, but God took Adam from where he was after he had already made him. God wasn't making Adam from the garden. He made him and placed him in the garden. And after having placed Adam in the garden, God now guides Adam in the process of having to name all the animals. And if you understand what the naming is there, is that it's, 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 it's about Adam giving the animals character. When you call a lion the king of a jungle, Adam gave the lion the character, but he did not name it lion because the, the letter L did not exist at that time. Neither did the letter I or O or N. Adam Neff. Adam definitely did not call a lion a lion, but he named it after its character, after who it should be, right? So now, after this process of naming the animals is done, God then sees that, wait, Adam has interacted with every animal here. He has given it its character. 
he has had time to interact with each and every animal. But for some reason, none of these animals have made for a perfect companion or helper for Adam in his assignment in the garden. Okay? So firstly, you need to understand that Adam may have spent a lot of time in the garden prior to Eve coming. Adam spent a lot of time with God under God's mentorship. God came, visited Adam, visited the garden. They talked, they interacted because God had placed a heavenly environment in the earth. Now I'd like you to go back a little before we comment on this particular scripture to when God actually made Adam. So we know that the Bible says, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. So man was formed a dead body from the dust of the ground, a lifeless body. God being a spirit was able to form the natural body of Adam, which was to function in this earth but Adam was lifeless. Now in order for Adam, who was already a spirit man, to function in the body that had been made for him, I'd like you to understand that Adam was made a spirit and God formed his body from the dust of the ground. But God had to breathe Adam into the body for Adam to now function here. So God breathes Adam into the body and Adam becomes a living soul. The soul becomes the interface by which Adam is able to interpret the thoughts of his spirit in the natural world. The desires of his spirit where the spirit wants to go, what the spirit wants to touch, what the spirit wants to eat. Adam could now do in his body. So Adam was given a vehicle in which he could operate. And the interface that enabled him to be conscious of this natural environment is the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. Right? Now, we know that God is, is not a natural man like us, he is not made from the dust of the ground. Jesus in the book of John chapter four, verse 24 says, God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So God being a spirit made Adam, but needed to interact with Adam. So God creates a spiritual environment within the earth. And that's why the Bible says God planted a garden. Think of it. How did God plant a garden? God did not plant trees to make a garden. There were already trees on the earth. We know that before man was made, God had already commanded the trees to come up from the ground. God had already divided the waters. So there were rivers, there were seas, there were lakes. We know that all manner of herb and plants were already existing on the earth. So what then does the Bible mean when the Bible says God planted a garden? What distinguished this particular garden from the rest of the trees that already existed in the earth? What distinguished this garden from the herbs that already existed in the earth? I'll give you one distinguishing factor. We know that the trees in the garden were able to satisfy the soul and not just the body. So the trees, for example, were able to communicate God's knowledge. The knowledge of good and evil was communicated by a tree. We know that trees were able to communicate life into man's spirit, into man's soul, into man's body to make man a permanent being like the angels. Remember Jesus in the book of Matthew being asked about the seven brothers who went through one wife and they asked him saying, because they did not believe in the resurrection. So they asked him, whose wife shall she be at the resurrection? If the first brother married her, 
died. The second brother marries her, died. The third brother marries her, died. All the way to the seventh. Then at the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? And Jesus responds by saying, you know not the scriptures, nor the power of God. Firstly, where in the scriptures was this described for Jesus to have said, you know not the scriptures? But that's a story for another day. You know not the scriptures, nor the power of God. You are in error, for you know not the scriptures, nor the power of God. And then he, he further goes on to explain the state of those that shall rise from the dead. He says, at the resurrection, they shall be neither giving in of marriage nor marrying, because... You shall be, those that shall be counted worthy of inheriting the earth shall be equal unto the angels, for they cannot die anymore. For they are the children of the resurrection. This was Jesus answering this question. Okay, so we can get a clue, a hint there on the state of angels. Angels cannot die, Jesus told us. And this will become the state of men after they have been raised from the dead on the last day. Now, if Adam had partaken of the tree of life, he would have become equal unto the angels to not be able to die anymore. But Adam would have been a permanent being in his disobedient state. That's why the, the cherub had to guard the way to the tree, right? So we know that in the garden, the trees could communicate. They could communicate life. They could communicate knowledge. They could communicate wisdom. The Bible says that when Eve saw that the fruit was good to the eye and that it was good to make one wise, she was attracted to it and so she ate. So she knew that this tree could give wisdom. So then... If God had planted a garden that is distinguishable from the rest of the trees on earth, and we know that one of the distinguishing factors is that the trees within the garden were able to communicate different aspects of God to the consumers of the fruits of those trees. Another um, aspect we can understand, another difference we can understand about this garden is that this garden was able to host God physically. God was able to come into the garden and interact with man physically because God had created a duality of worlds in the garden. The garden was able to host the natural and the spirit world and the spirit world, not world, but world, the spirit world at the same time. Okay. So I'd like you to understand the state of the garden. Now, when God and Adam have been interacting in this garden for a long time, God realizes, he comes to a conclusion. He makes an assessment based on Adam's interaction with the animals. And this educates God's mindset on the situation. Was this to say that God never had a plan for woman to be before? No, the Bible says male and female, he made them and he named them Adam. So God already had the human race inside Adam. And God had already given the earth to Adam. Therefore, he could not go back to the earth to make any more human beings. Everyone had to be inside Adam because Adam was the owner of the earth. And in order for the earth then to host more human beings, they all had to come out of Adam. I hope that's clear to you. Now, God decides then that in order to achieve this, I will have to put Adam in a deep sleep. There are two things that happen when God puts Adam in a deep sleep. Number one, we can see that God opens up Adam's flesh. We see the first operation there. God opens up Adam's flesh, removes a rib, and closes back Adam's flesh. But the second thing we can also see there is that though these things are happening while Adam is put in a deep sleep, he is aware of them. How do we know 
that Adam is aware of what's going on is because he prophesied when the woman was brought to him. I would like you to also take note that the Bible does not say Adam woke up and the woman was brought to him. The Bible only talks about Adam going into a deep sleep. It does not talk about Adam rising up from the deep sleep. Also, the Bible talks about Adam describing where the woman came from. Oh, now this is born of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now in Adam giving woman the name woman, he is already assigning a purpose for the entire human race. Woman does not only describe Eve's source having come from a man, but it also describes her function, which he later named her for when he named her Eve because she shall be the mother of all creation. But woman also describes the function that now we have a man who carries a womb that is able to produce the rest of mankind, hence fulfilling God's commandment, replenish the earth, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. The replenishing could only happen after Eve came because Eve carried the womb. So we see the first instant of prophecy occurring when Adam is put into a deep sleep and he begins, he begins to describe where the woman came from as though he witnessed it. I hope you're following. So now, the spirit of prophecy already has kicked in right from the start. Because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here's a question I would like to ask you and leave with you that you may ponder upon. Whose seed did God refer to Jesus Christ as? when he cursed the serpent. To whom was God referring when he said, her seed will crush the serpent's head? He was referring to Eve, right? Because the seed had to come from Eve. So Eve coming out of Adam was already be the beginning of the testimony of Jesus Christ. The fact that Eve came out of Adam itself is a testimony of Jesus Christ. Right there, the spirit of prophecy is introduced into the world. Now, many of you may wonder or may want to distinguish the gift of prophecy from the spirit of prophecy. Let me explain something to you. The Bible calls God, the God of the spirits, of all flesh. The Bible calls God the God of the spirits of all flesh. The Bible further calls God the Father of spirits. One thing I need you to understand is that there is nothing in our world that does not have a spirit. Neither what we say, what we do, what we see, what we touch. All these things have spirits. Everything. The Bible has gone as far as telling us that God is in all those things for which we call upon him for. God is in all those things we call upon him for. If I call God, if I call God, upon, if I call English, if I call upon God for this coffee, he is in it. God is a spirit. If God being a spirit is able to be in this coffee, it shows us that there is space in this coffee for a spirit to dwell. I'll ask you a question. Where exactly in your body does your spirit dwell? Because your body 
does not seem to have an inhabited space for a spirit to dwell. But are you able to trace exactly where the spirit is inside your body? I'll leave that as homework for you. So when we see the spirit of prophecy, many might want to distinguish it from the gift of prophecy. But what the spirit of prophecy simply means is the source of prophecy, where prophecy comes from, the actual spirit that is responsible for prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The purpose for this spirit that is responsible for prophecy, the very purpose, the reason why the spirit of prophecy is there is because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the testimony of Jesus Christ has become the spirit of prophecy. But I want you to know that the testimony of Jesus Christ and the spirit of prophecy did not only come after Jesus Christ came to earth, the testimony of Jesus Christ has been going on from the foundation of the earth. This is why we can see at the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, that the prophet, the prophets and the law are represented by Moses and Elijah because these put together are the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, who is the body of the shadow, in the book of Colossians, it describes all these things as having been the shadow, but the body is of Christ. So the body of the shadow, the law and the prophets is Christ Jesus. So when Christ Jesus appeared, the body whose shadow had already been cast had finally appeared. Right? So now we can see that every time a prophecy is given before Christ came, it somehow pointed to the purpose of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even after Jesus died, rose again, and went back to heaven, prophecy did not change in its purpose. It now proves that we have a, a God who is alive and well. So then the spirit of prophecy is the cause behind the manifestation of the gift of prophecy. It is also the cause behind the manifestation of the office of a prophet, the spirit of prophecy. So God is the God of the spirit and not the manifestation. God is the God of the spirit and not the manifestation. What we see here physically is a manifestation of the actual spirit of the thing. What you see here is a manifestation of the spirit of the living being. When Adam was made, remember his body was dead. God had to breathe the actual life into the body, into the image. What we can see in this world is the, is the, is the body, the image, right? Remember, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So the image should resemble the likeness. What you see when you see someone's body is simply the glory of the spirit behind, the appearance of the spirit. The behavior is of the spirit, but the appearance is of the body. So when you see the body, you can trace it back to the spirit. So when we see God forming Eve from Adam, we know that God took from Adam's spirit. He did not, the Bible does not describe God breathing into Eve a new spirit. He took from Adam's spirit, he took from Adam's body and formed Eve. So Eve had always been in Adam, just like you always had been in your father, right? So we see the first manifestation of the spirit of prophecy. In the second scripture I showed you where a similar scenario happens to, a similar situation happens to Abram before he had been renamed to Abraham. Abram is taken into a deep sleep. The Bible says horror. Now, the interesting thing is that before Adam went into, before Abram went into this deep sleep, 
He had already received the word of the Lord. Okay. He had been talking with God. God was telling him, I will give you seed. I'll give you a son that will come from your own loins because Abraham was saying, Lord, what shall you give unto me for the one that will inherit my property is someone who was born in my house, but is not my son. And God says, don't worry, Abraham. I will give you a son that will come out of your own body in the actual words of God. But before God could now tell him about Israel and how they'll be taken into captivity and how they'll be delivered, because that is where the whole story and journey to the birth of Jesus Christ begins, right? Before God can tell him that, he first puts Abram into a deep sleep in order for God to specifically give him the details of how long the children of Israel will take there, what will happen to them, and how he will die, God had to first separate Abram from his natural consciousness, put him into a deep sleep in order to introduce the spirit of prophecy. Now, I want you to see the distinction between the spirit of prophecy's manifestation and the gift of prophecy. Of course, we know how prophets prophesied in the Bible, and I will not get into, into that, but we know that before they could prophesy, they did not fall into a deep sleep in order to, to prophesy. Then what distinguishes Adam and Abram from the rest of the prophets? Why did they have to be put into a deep sleep? This is because God is introducing a spirit into a lineage that must produce a Messiah. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So for Abram to have carried this assignment that would lead to the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, he needed to have carried the testimony in him. So the testimony had to enter Abram as it had to enter Adam. And this testimony is what produced the power for the line to be continued all the way to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we... How do we make sense of this in light of the gift of prophecy? You see, the gift of prophecy continues this function of the spirit of prophecy, of recounting the testimony. Now, I know some of you might take my words and say, does this mean that every prophecy must speak of Jesus Christ? No, that is not what it means. As a matter of fact, the two examples I've given you did not specifically mentioned Jesus Christ, what they mentioned were two significant events that have, had they not happened, may not have produced the end result. Had they not happened, might not have produced the end result. Why do I say so? Adam needed to have Eve for Jesus to come. But for that to happen, the testimony had to come first. Have you noticed that before God does anything, he speaks it first? Let us make man in our own image and likeness. Let them have dominion. Let us go down and confuse their languages. God as a matter of fact, the book of Amos says, God shall not do anything in the earth without telling his servants, the prophets. So before God does anything, he speaks it first because the words that God speaks produce the manifestation. Wow, there's so much I would, love, I would love to explain to you, but I just don't know how to tell it to you. I hope what I've given you so far in itself has computed in your minds. So then the gift of prophecy comes to fulfill the very same assignment that its spirit carries. The gift of prophecy is not only about foretelling future events as many people may have described it or understood it, but the gift of prophecy is about carrying the testimony of Jesus Christ in ways that are able to uh, 
prove his reality, before Jesus came, the prophetic pointed towards his coming. After Jesus came, the prophetic pointed towards him having come. So remember the Bible says he is the one who was and is and is to come. So the spirit of prophecy must fulfill all three, was, is, is to come. I hope this, this makes sense to you. And so the Bible further tells us that above all gifts, we must desire that we can prophesy. Because if we can desire prophecy, what we are desiring is the testimony to have the testimony of Jesus. This testimony is so important that the Bible describes the spirit of the Antichrist as the exact opposite of the spirit of prophecy. That the spirit of Antichrist is that spirit that denies that Jesus came in the flesh and died and was raised on the, on the third day. Right? While the spirit of prophecy testifies that Jesus came. Now, how exactly will you make an unbeliever know that Jesus truly came, truly died, truly was raised from the dead by God and was taken up into glory and is alive today and we are waiting for his return. How else will you prove this except by being able to tell the unbeliever what this Jesus is saying today? So the gift of prophecy fulfills the assignment of its spirit the spirit of prophecy. I hope you guys got that and loved it. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe, hit that bell and share. We've come to the end of this Bible Talks. I know, I know, I know. I loved it too. I'll see you on the next one. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.